Kwai Kakina, we believe it is important to acknowledge that even as we gather virtually, we are on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. We want to thank our partners in organizing this event, the Ottawa International Writers Festival and QUART, Ottawa Queer Arts Collective. Tonight, we are so happy to host a conversation with Brad Fraser about his new book and first memoir called All the Rage, a Partial Memoir in Two Acts and a Prologue. Brad is a prolific playwright and the Ottawa Public Library has several of his plays in its collection. So you know where you can check them out after this event. I'm sure the discussion this evening will be a lively one with a moderator and author of such talent, wit and humor. I do want to remind you that May is Asian Heritage Month and I invite you all to join us on Thursday at 7 p.m. for one of the several programs highlighting Asian culture, a presentation and interactive discussion on Uzbekistan called Draw My Life in Uzbekistan. You can always visit the OPL Ottawa Public Library website to discover all our programs and to access the wide range of content and resources that come with a library card. It is now my pleasure to introduce Glenn Yuatiao, a co-founder of QUART, Ottawa Queer Arts Collective, which has partnered with the International Writers Festival to arrange this evening's event, to say a few words. Thank you and have a great evening. Merci et bonne soirée. And now over to you, Glenn. Thank you, Harvey, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm also broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I'm so thrilled to welcome you all to tonight's event on behalf of Part Ottawa. And um, as one of the co-founders of Quart, uh, I'd like to thank the OPL, Ottawa Public Library, and Ottawa Writers Festival as a queer arts collective uh, looking to help inspire creativity and the reclaiming of queer spaces. Uh, it's really great that they could include us in this launch of such a culturally important and queerly honest memoir, um, All the Rage by Brad Fraser. Um, so Brad Fraser is one of Canada's best known playwrights. He was born in Edmonton, Alberta, and he won his first playwriting competition at the age of 17. Uh, and he's been writing ever since. Uh, Brad's international hit play, Unidentified Human Remains and the True Nature of Love, premiered in 1989 and has been produced uh, since then worldwide in many languages with highly successful runs in Toronto, New York, Chicago, Milan, Sydney, and London. Then Poor Superman in 1994 enjoyed successful runs in many cities, including Denver, Toronto, London, Sydney, and Edinburgh. And it was nominated for a Governor General's uh, Literary Award for Drama and adapted to a feature film. Um, Leaving Metropolis, which was also written and directed by Brad, Poor, Su Poor Superman, uh, sorry, Poor, Poor Superman uh, was listed by Time Magazine as one of the top 10 plays of the year. Um, Brad has also written extensively for magazines and newspapers, uh, including the Globe and Mail and the National Post, and for three seasons was a writer and producer on Showtime's Queer as Folk. Uh, many other plays uh, since then have followed in successful international productions. Um, we'd like, and, and on behalf of the Writers' Festival, I'd also like to thank you for supporting authors and booksellers during this, uh, these difficult times. Uh, the festival's official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street here in Ottawa, but I know that wherever you are right now, there's an independent bookseller uh, ready uh, to sell you some great books. Um, so this Writers' Festival spring season continues into June, and it's all available online and on demand at writersfestival.org. So we're so pleased to have as our host tonight, Canadian actor, comedian, and writer, Gavin Crawford. Um, Gavin is one of Canada's brightest comedic and dramatic performers, and he's best known for his work on This Hour's 22 Minutes, CBC's uh, Radio's Because News, and uh, The Gavin Crawford Show on the um, Comedy Network. Like Brad, Gavin is also from Alberta, and uh, Gavin's work has been honored in the past with the Canadian Comedy Award, two Door Awards, an Actor Award for Outstanding Male Actor, and a Canadian Screen Award for Best Writing of a Comedy Program. He's also produced several one-man shows himself, including the sold-out Fringe Festival, Friend Like Me. And you can find Gavin everywhere online. And now I'm really looking forward to this conversation, and I want to hand it over to Gavin. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Glenn, and thank you, uh, Ottawa Public Library, for having us. I am uh, absolutely overjoyed to be here tonight uh, to be able to talk uh, to uh, someone who uh, started off as a legend to, to me and then later on uh, became a friend. Uh, he is uh, always uh, hilarious to talk to, no matter when you talk to him, and uh, amazing and outspoken. And uh, please welcome the incredible Brad Fraser. Brad. Hi. Hi. I hope you're there. I can't. I can't see what's seeing on the screen. I hope it's both of us. I can and see to, you. I'm here. to everyone uh, joining us on Zoom or Facebook Live, welcome. We are going to open up uh, questions uh, at a certain point uh, that you can ask Brad uh, about all the rage or about whatever. Uh, please use the Q and A function on Zoom. You can see it at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That's how we're going to be fielding the questions, and uh, then uh, you'll get a chance to ask your questions to Brad. Uh, so I don't know. Let's jump right in. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Brad, on All the Rage. Thank uh, you. It's an incredible read. It's so funny and uh, sad and cheeky and <laughs> heart. I just, I don't know. There, It was great. And the title is amazing, too, because it's very classic Brad, because it's a double-edged sword where you were. And there's all lots the... <laughs> of things called that. It's a very common title. I did, a, I did a search on it. Lots of things are called All the Rage. Is that why you went with the subtitle of a memoir in two acts, just to differentiate, or you just wanted yeah, to be Yeah, also that sounded with. kind of Shakespearean or theatrical or whatever, so I wanted a bit of that in there. And it, I mean, it definitely, when you look at sort of your early life and early career, and maybe later, like you, at a certain point, <laughs> were definitely all the rage, but you were holding all the rage inside of you. Uh, like, well, let's start at the beginning, your childhood, um, your relationship with your father and mother. You said in your book, you knew your upbringing had instilled a tremendous anger within you and that if you didn't find a way to channel it constructively, it would end up directed at those around you or yourself. Uh, and that led you to more creative pursuits. Has yeah. that changed? <laughs> no, that's still where I put my anger pretty much is into my, you know, whatever I'm doing creatively or, uh, I don't want to hurt other people with it. I think when you're from a background like I am and, and you ha have those things that have happened, you sort of have a choice to either become a very destructive personality or a very self-destructive personality or an artist or a serial killer. And those are about <laughs> your only choices. So I went with artist because I wanted, it was very important to me to escape my background, to leave where I was behind and not be trapped there. Like I saw so many people around me happening to them. Uh, I wanted something else. I wanted to go farther. I didn't want to, you know, live in small towns and work road construction and get drunk and pe beat people up. I wanted a life of, of glamour and fame and fortune. So uh, that's what I went for when I when I stopped uh, when I left my regular high school and went to a high school for the performing arts in Edmonton in the late seventies. Well, you say uh, a very interesting thing in sort of the early part of the book, which is that um, I don't know if this is just like a gay thing or a creative person thing, but it really resonated with me where you said like you just had a knack to hone in on a person's like ultimate weakness and be able to like decimate them with a quip, and you had to channel you had to channel that rage into somewhere else or you would just right. simply have no friends. Right, well, but it, it also was how I learned to protect myself. You know, I was uh, I was not always the, uh, you know, refrigerator size man I am right now. I was a, a very slight uh, uh, kid who was new in town and bullied a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, and I had to find a way to protect myself. And the best way I could do it was by being very sensitive to what people were insecure about and being able to grab that and hurt them with it if I had to. It's unfortunate, but you know, that was the defense mechanism I had as a child and a teenager. Yeah, I mean, I have that, I had that similar thing. And it's like, I know. Translated into a career of jokes. Uh, but what can you do? Uh, yeah, I mean, so you started off like loving comics, drawing, but why plays? Why was theater the thing, not only that you went to at first, because oftentimes you just go to the first thing that's available to you, but then, you know, you you stick with, you've written screenplays, you've written for TV and film, but you always come back to the theater. What is it about the theater that is your main ride? The, the theater, first of all, you don't need all the tech. To create, to create film, to create TV, even to create comic books and, and to draw and paint, you need a lot of tech. Whereas with, uh, with the theater, if you have tech, that's great, but you can also make theater without tech. And I remember 
going to see this, uh, this musical called Philemon that was written by Tom Jones and Harvey Schmidt, who wrote The Fantastics, very little known show, which was really helpful because it wasn't something I brought any baggage to at all. And it was a musical with a cast of eight and a band of two or three. And it was done entirely in a black box theater with some sticks and barrels and things. And the way that they would transform all of that stuff just amazed me. And I thought, you know, we talk a lot about, about magic and, and, you know, where is magic and where does magic exist? And I sort of came to realize that the only place where you can actually perform true magic is in the theater where we have these, these words that are incantations and we learn these gestures and these movements that make things happen and tell the audience a story. And then you can literally do anything. You know, if I, if I read a screenplay and I say, okay, this scene's set in Atlantis at the bottom of the sea full of mer people. Well, we've just spent millions of dollars on building Atlantis and the mer people. But if I do that on stage, we have some actors just walking around, maybe moving their little weirdly like mer people and we hit them with a green light and the audience does all the work for us. We don't have to create any of that kind of stuff. So for me, I like the, the freedom of that, of not having to build and construct and, and you know, have all this accoutrement around you. But I also like the idea that um, you, you enlist the audience into what you're doing. You win their trust and you ask them to do some of the work and they do it happily. And for me, that creates a much more uh, uh, hot in terms of sort of McLuhan, the McLuhan emotion thing, uh, a, a medium that people are really involved in that they can't hang back from. They have to move into further. And that's why I keep going back to the theater because you can't really do that anywhere else or in any other discipline. No, because it really is a kind of magic that you only know when you're in the theater doing it, where you're like the audience is helping you perform a magic trick and then you all kind of do it together yes. in a weird way. But it, it genuinely feels, to me at least, like magic. Yeah, it's, I didn't it's realize cool. quite how much I missed or loved live things until the last 14 months where it really like hit home for me that it's just no moving, no amount of Zoom is a replacement for that. Feeling. No, it's like these come and see my theater thing on Zoom stuff. You know, it's not theater kids. It's just bad TV, no matter how well you're doing it, that that, that, that in-person connection, that, that group mind, when everybody is imagining the same thing together, the power, and you know that being on stage, when you have the audience imagining that, it does a magic, a kind of magic on the performer as well. It does a magic on the writer. I mean, I sit in the audience in the theater and I, I see where they're going and I see how cooperative they are going there. And I think, I did that. I'm the I'm the magician who wrote down the incantation that the actors on stage are now doing that summons this world that I've created. And you don't get that on film. You don't get that on TV. And, and you know, that's why I think, like you, I'm really missing live performance in the theater right now. Which? That's all I have to say. To that. Exactly. <laughs> I'll be burned at the stake. Uh, well, you know, won't we all? Um... Where should I, what should I ask you now? There's so many, I, there's so many things about this book that I, uh, where I could go. Um, so I'm going to jump a little bit now just to sure, jump around. Uh, when the first time I saw Unidentified Human Reigns was in Vancouver and I was like fresh from Alberta and I went to university and it was the first time I ever sat in the theater and I saw a, a play that was set where I was from, where people were Canadian and not even just Canadian, but Albertan. And they were talking like the people that I knew in a style that I had never really heard <laughs> on stage. And it was it was really just mind blowing on any number of levels, not to mention that there was a bare ass in it. And that was also exciting for me. But it was, um, it just felt so new to me. I mean, when you, and you talked about like, when you start out writing, wanting to reflect like, you know, characters that you knew and, um, and, but that somehow was a struggle. People didn't glom onto it right away. Well, no, I'm the wrong class. I'm entirely the wrong class for the theater. You're supposed to be writing about people who went to university and own paintings and live in flats in New York and London and that kind of thing. And I was coming from dirt, from, you know, the farm and trailer courts and, and that kind of an upbringing. And I wanted to bring 
that world into the theater, but I also wanted to show that world that they could come to the theater, that there was a place for them. And what we really learned in Remains is I remember everywhere it played, the theater would go, who are these people? Where are they coming from? These are not our regular audience members. Who are they and how do we get them back? I never was able to answer how to get them back, but uh, I knew who they were and they were people that I grew up with. They were people I went to clubs with. They were people I slept with. They were people that I was promoting it to who were people like me who never realized there was something in the theater that may speak to them. And that's sort of my, my the thing that makes me most proud about Remains was it brought in a brand new audience who didn't normally go to the theater. Well, and I think it's one thing that's very important in theater is to not only like tell the story, <laughs> tell those people's stories, but to to invite people into the, the theater to come and see themselves instead of it being like a fishbowl. Like, I mean, I, I'm not going to say this eloquently, but that theater, it's like, look at these poor people. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> Which right, there yeah. is a lot of. And, you know, so to do something completely opposite of that, of that is really great. Um, there's a, an audience question coming in, so I'm just gonna ask you it. Uh, oh. Somebody wants to know about a time you were involved in a production where everything went right, A, was there, and it just kept getting better, better from like the start to the finish. And I think in the book, there is one of those, uh, versus a time when something looked like everything was going right and it all went to hell. Yeah, well, you know, my uh, my feeling is if you talk to an actor about how's how's it going in rehearsal, and they're oh, it's fabulous. We all love each other, and everyone's getting along so well. That's probably not going to be the show to go and see. When I talk to people and I say, you know, how's it going, and they say, oh my god, we don't know what we're doing. We're never going to get it together. This is so weird. It's so difficult. I think that's the show that's going to work. You know, my feeling is uh, just generally that if everybody's too comfortable you're probably not gonna come up with a really exciting show because theater is based on conflict. And to think that we can work in the theater and create theater and somehow avoid conflict is an idiot thing to believe and also an idiot thing to go for. I mean, I'm talking about constructive conflict here, not just mm -hmm. someone being an asshole. Uh, I do have to say, um, it's interesting that one of the shows that came together the best and the fastest for me was The Ugly Man in Edmonton, and it was because we only had two weeks of rehearsal, and then we were in the theater and going into tech and things, so that I had a cast of actors I knew very well, I had worked with most of them before, they understood my shorthand, I understood their issues, and I was able to, we were able to, under this incredible pressure, come up with a show and nobody had time to kind of be an asshole or get insecure, or be a diva or whatever. Everyone had to be really concentrated. They liked the play. It was a really interesting production. And when we got into the theater, it was amazing because two weeks as, as pe if people out there work in the theater, performers or whatever, no, that's not a lot of time. But the work that we had to do in that period of time was so concentrated that it just kind of exploded on opening night and was one of the shows I'm most proud of. You know, and I've had other shows where you've got <laughs> the right actors, the right designers, the right everybody, and we have enough time and it's all come, going to come together. And somehow it never really does. It's, it's almost like uh, you fill up the time you have with the bullshit you need in order to be able to do it. But if you have too much of it, then, you know, people start getting extraneous about it. So I, I, I can't remember one specifically where that happened but i do know that it's happened to me and, and it's happened to a number of other people i know as well where everyone's just getting along too well they love the project too much they love each other too much and ultimately what they open is not very exciting to anyone but them yeah i mean i'm i'm interested in your uh you talk about when you had your early success the critics being like sort of double-edged sort of you got a lot of like sort of homophobic reaction which you know we could talk about for days on end uh but then also the classist reaction of it right you know and you know hopefully the theater has gotten less classes but has it no not at all it's even more <laughs> classes are you kidding now now you cannot be in the theater unless you have a, a, a university degree or preferably a a, a, a post-university degree you know that we have all these people now who have had the same education in our commodified university system, who come out with the same ideas and are, are, are actually afraid to challenge those ideas. So I think it's actually gotten worse. Whereas I think in the seventies and early eighties, 
when it was still kind of wide open territory in the Wild West when it came to the theater and they were looking for people specifically to try to make it interesting and exciting, I think there was a lot more opportunity for someone like me to come in and kind of kick the doors down. Whereas I look at it now and, you know, a lot of the younger artistic directors I see now, if they were confronted by someone like me, they'd probably call the cops. I mean, they'd probably <laughs> fall apart because I spoke too loud. So that, that class thing, and I think that's also why a lot of the, uh, the Canadian theatres that we've seen that used to bring in a lot of people doing new Canadian work aren't doing it anymore. And it's because the work has become homogenized, it, become, it has become watered down, and nobody wants to take a chance because they're afraid of offending someone. Whereas when I started out, uh, you know, offending people was fun. In the 70s, yeah. being offended, we went to things because we wanted to be offended. You know, and that that idea that, oh, no, you can't offend me or you you ruin my life has kind of fucked up theater and entertainment in general for everybody. Yeah, I think I would agree. <laughs> I would agree with that. But I mean, you did have still the challenge, like you fortunately had a few people who were willing to sort of fight for you, like in, in early productions yes. uh, when you were, you know, putting on shows and then the board would want to cancel it. Yes, that almost always whatever happened. reason because of the language yeah. or whatever euphemism for there's a gay in this yes. uh, that they would use. But you would usually you manage to find someone who would be on your side to be like, let's at least get the thing on its feet. I was very lucky in that way. I mean, I have a lot of, you know, I mean, Paul Thompson and Jerry Potter and people like that throughout my life. And it's very odd because most of them are straight men who I don't share a lot of aesthetic uh, similarities with and yet they have been the ones who have said look I don't, I don't know how this is going to go over and I don't know why you're doing it and I don't know how you're doing it but there is something here and so I will support you in that and that was really important to me you know if it had been an absolute fight every time I probably would have got bored and just started writing tv for the money and left the <laughs> entirely you know yeah I mean well it is a little bit like you know it's not meant to be this but your memoir has no choice but to kind of be like a who's who of Canadian theater history <laughs> because you've crossed paths with all of them. But I am a little bit curious that like one of your early mentors was Paul Thompson, who's like known for collective things. And yeah, I would the... I would think of you less as a collective person. Well, yes and no. I mean, you know, when you work on a TV show in the writer's room, as I did on Queer as Folk, that's a very collective thing to do. Nobody's, well, people are the boss in there, but they're not me. Yeah. Uh, so you have to do that kind of thing. And I do enjoy uh, collaborating. I, I enjoy collective work. Uh, I just sort of felt like by the time Thompson brought me in to work on a collective, they were kind of on their way out as a really interesting, exciting form of theater. And uh, my plays were exciting people far more than the collective kind of things. So for me, you know, and I am a writer. I mean, I'm a writer, director. And also those collectives that Paul did in the early days, they always had a writer there in the end who came in and curated and arranged and edited and wrote the fucking play. Well, that's what I'm always curious about because I know from my, like, I'm just like, I, I don't mind being working on something collectively, but I, my feeling is you have to have not, if not a boss, at least a writer or someone to guide it through. So I was always, I'm just curious how you felt yeah, but, that but work. I, I ended up resenting that. I sort of felt like these actors were coming in and doing all these improvs and then expecting me to make it brilliant. And I kind of thought, well, if I'm going to make it brilliant, I'm not going to make it brilliant for <laughs> you. I'm going to make it brilliant for me and what I want to do because I'm the writer. So it was, uh, and also I was probably, you know, too young at uh, 21 or whatever, 22, I believe I was when I was, when I was doing that with Paul. But in the end, you know, I said to him, I want to leave. And he said, oh no, you can't go. You're the most exciting thing. What do you want to do? And I said, well, let's get rid of all these actors. And why don't you let me write a play and I'll put it on. And he said, okay, you've got three weeks. And we did it, and that was rude noises in the in the backspace at Pass Marai. And it was it was kind of a it was like it came from uh, the work they had been doing earlier, but it was supposed to be about street kids in Toronto. And he hired a bunch of white York graduates, you know, like what yeah. these people know about living on the street or whatever, right? So it was a little maybe just not quite put together well enough in the beginning. Well, I mean, one of the things that I always have loved about you as a person is just that you you do not you're not a bullshit tolerator and you have no problem 
calling out something that you think is a bullshitty opinion or like all the way along and through the memoir that's like you know there's many many examples of that with various like powerful directors i particularly like when you go off on that uh, canadian trend of getting mediocre british directors to come in and run our festivals for several right. years at the end of their career but you know most people wouldn't say that out loud which is why i, well, I, enjoy I, it. I don't have a problem saying it out loud and and you know frankly i've outlasted a lot of those people and they're not all from england a lot of them for, are from america as well they used to come up here a lot and you know, I remember talking to Sharon Pollock the first year I was in, let's cross ourselves and bless her. She's departed recently. She was such a force in theater, but it was Sharon the first time I uh, was at, at the Banff uh, Playwrights Colony who talked to me about the importance of Canadian money going to Canadian productions. That what the hell are we doing supporting a Stratford festival? Beyond that, what the hell are we doing supporting a George Bernard Shaw festival? I mean, he's the most boring writer. <laughs> I knew you were going to say it. <laughs> and we've got a fucking festival for him in Canada. Like, where the hell does that come from? But, but that had stuff had never occurred to me before because I grew up, as we all did, with this kind of uh, conglomeration of American and English uh, entertainment being forced on us all the time. So the idea of having a, a, a Canadian story was brand new. I mean, you're talking about remains, but I remember seeing, you know, Morell's uh, waiting for the parade at Lunchbox Theater downstairs at the library in Edmonton in 77 or whatever it was. And one of the actors said Alberta on the stage. And I had this kind of schizophrenic episode where I didn't know what to do with that because no one had ever said Alberta on a stage before in my life, to my knowledge. So it was this idea of hey, we do have a right to be here. In fact, we have the biggest right to be here and to tell our stories. And, and you know, Sharon Pollock was really very much the first person who sort of twigged me into those ideas and the idea of nationalism and supporting our own artists rather than artists from other countries. And was it just brashness that you just never worried about? Like, oh, this is a powerful person. I should probably not, you know, piss them off. I sort of assumed I would piss any powerful person off anyway, no matter what I did. So I did reach a point where I just didn't care. But I also have to say, Gavin, you know, the, uh, the second time I won the Alberta Culture Playwriting Competition, one of the prizes was uh, a production at a brand new theater in town. And that director came to Banff with me and worked on the play. And at the end of the week or whatever it was said, yeah, you know what, we're not going to do your play. We're going to do the second place play because... Well, we just don't think our audience, which we don't have because they're a brand new theater, uh, is ready for this play, which was not in any, it had a gay character in it. It didn't have, I wasn't even out at the time. It had a kid who hustled in it and it got canceled for that. And I remember being heartbroken, but I didn't say anything. And I carried that around for a long time. And I, a couple months after that happened, I said to myself, that is never going to happen again. I will not allow that to happen. I will not allow someone to do something like that to me without saying something very strongly and, and standing up for it and, and fighting for it. And, and you only need one or two experiences like that before you go, okay, I think I actually am better off saying something than not saying something because either way, the play is canceled. I might as well have had the satisfaction of telling the guy to shut up and fuck off. Well, you kind of, yeah. I mean, you really do have to, as you, as you say, uh, numerous times in the memoir like there there's all kinds of examples of people who will just be like no we're just not going to do this and if you don't speak up nobody will and even yeah. when you do speak up half of the time nobody else will yes like that again it's in the book the story about the actors in uh, the original production of remains whining and kvetching and having breakdowns and calling me constantly and finally i just got sick of it and went into the rehearsal hall and said, okay, let's stop everything. Let's sit down. Let's talk honestly about this. You know, 80% of the actors in the show have called me and said they're having a horrible time, director. What are you going to do about it? And she said, oh, I didn't know anything about that. And I looked at the cast and they all went, oh, no, we're okay. It's, it's all right. No, we're okay with what's going on. And sold me down the river. And I thought, yeah, okay, so I'm not going to be able to rely on them either. So I better just yeah. find a way to do this on my own, to get enough power that I can do this on my own and I don't have to wait for anybody to back me up. Yeah, well, <laughs> good show. <laughs> um, 
I'm what am I looking at here? I want to talk a little bit about um I don't know where should we go to the 80s? <laughs> There's so many things to think about that I'm losing my train. For this is what I want to talk about right now. Uh when people say, Oh, you don't write likable characters, how much does that get under your skin? <laughs> It's really annoying. I mean, it, it, it is really annoying. You know, who's likable in Hamlet? Again, you know, yeah. Who's, who, who's likable in Gone with the Wind? Like, you know, the servants, basically. I mean, who's likable in some of the great uh, literature and, and works of art? It's a, it's a bullshit kind of comment. My feeling is, are they interesting and are they compelling enough to keep our interest for two or two and a half hours or whatever they have to? Not to be likable. And part of that, I suppose, comes from... Um, I don't want to have to be likable to get my work done. I don't want to have to be, I don't want to be one of those people who gets hired because everybody likes them and they're fun to work with. I always wanted to be one of those people that we hired him, even though he's a son of a bitch, because we're really <laughs> glad about the things we get in the end or whatever, you know, but this, this need to be likable, there's something really kind of weak about it. There's something that bothers me about it. And, and. Well, it we, also always feels like a lie. Well, but also we are working in an industry where, you know, people do get work because they're likable, but you go see those likable people at the bar after the show and see what they're talking about to one another and see how likable they are there, right? Like that being like that all the time costs something. And usually the cost is you're very nice to everybody's face. And then you get together with your actor friends, your writer friends afterwards and have drinks and you're a total asshole and hate everyone and nothing but bile comes out of you the entire time. I don't want to be a person who spews bile except when there's bile to be spewed, if you know what I mean. Yeah, when you want to, you use the word snatchy a few times in this uh, memoir, which is, I, I hadn't come across snatchy uh, so many times, but it's a very perfect word. <laughs> yeah, and I think I use uh, to describe my friend Cameron's laugh a lot. That's mostly where it's used. Yeah, what do you mean by snatchy? Well, there was another word I was using that some okay. people were having a problem <laughs> with. So I thought, well, we'll just go for a, a more acceptable version of that word, and then they'll all like me. Oh, I like that you Margaret Atwood the the C word and, <laughs> and just made it be like, I'll invent a different word that means yeah. the same thing. Yeah. As soon as I, it made me laugh very hard when I read that, because I'm like, that is actually a perfect word. <laughs> um, I just want to uh, ask you about this. Uh, it's not even that germane, but when you first went to a gay bar uh, and you're young and the first time you go to a gay bar in the Edmonton. Smell? You ha say this very funny thing about the smell. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, because when I first, you know, it was like, I think, 77, the first time I went into a gay bar and I went in and, and you know, after you get over all of the danger and the wonder and the lust and everything that's happening, I went, there's this, there's this smell and I only ever smell it when I'm at the gay bar. It's really weird. And I thought, well, I don't know what that smell is, but I, I like it. And it, it seems like everybody smells like that except me. I wonder if there's like a, a sack of something in your butt that breaks the first time you get fucked or something, and then we all smell like that. And I mentioned this to a friend of mine. He went, no, Brad, that's Aramis. We're all wearing Aramis. And I thought, oh, that's so sad. That's so easy. I thought it was like a, a gay man smell that came the first time you had sex or something, and now we could smell each other in the dark and things like that. But no, right. it's just it's a, not a coming of age. Brad, you're a gay man now. You, you've got the Aramis scent of you. Exactly. Oh, that is that was very funny to me. I think partly because one time uh, Kyle came downstairs and I was like, you smell like the bathhouse. And then he, and he's like, what? And then I went, he was wearing that cologne. He was so wearing like, It was Erebus. Oh, it hasn't changed in like that amount of years. time. Yeah. No. I still have a bottle of Erebus and I will put some on occasionally when I want to be ironic. You know, <laughs> I want to smell ironic, I will wear Erebus. But that's the only time <laughs> I wear any kind of a scent anymore. I'm, I like that you're drawing them in ironically. Uh, half about halfway through uh, your memoir, when you started to work on, um, I think it's Human Remains, you sort of laid out three things you say that you you wanted to do with your characters that were things you hadn't seen before. Uh, what were those three things? Uh, to have a gay lead character who wasn't begging for people's tolerance, but was actually demanding he be treated like everyone else. Uh, to have a gay character who wasn't uh, infected with HIV or dying of AIDS. 
I can't remember the third one. Do you? Uh, it was uh, to uh, write a female character that didn't follow society's rules about how oh, women yes. should act. Candy, yes. And I really wanted to make her the shit disturber. I wanted to make her the one who was raising all the trouble. And it's funny because, you know, in the early days of the plague, people used to, um, certain people used to say, oh, well, your women are weak and Candy's weak and she's just a victim and blah, 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 which I never believed. But interestingly, six or seven years ago, Spencer and I went to um, uh, Brazil to see a production of Remains. Mm -hmm. And they had taken it apart because it was this sort of environmental thing that was taking place in a building and outside and all of that kind of stuff. And they took Candy's scenes and did them all kind of separately from David's scenes. And I went, she runs the play. Everything that happens in this play happens through her actions. He just reacts to it. And it was so interesting to realize that and to think, what were you, why were you harassing me about this female character? You know what the real issue is? She's not likable. She's not a particularly likable character. Neither is David. Neither is anybody in the play. But there's always that thing of, oh, why do you write such unlikable women? It's, well, because women are generally as unlikable as men, and I want to be <laughs> fair in that. You know, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, to be fair, in your in all the rage, you make a point of highlighting like a lot of the women in your life and the importance that they've played in like your oh, of course, career. And, and also, I've like lived that. in a world without women. You know, I've lived in the the male world without women. I was doing that quite a lot in the '90s in the the circuit scene and the party scene and stuff. And it's a really limited world. It isn't nearly as interesting as a world with women in it. You know. How do you feel when you, I mean, not just Human Remains, but a number of your plays have been produced in uh, like South Korea and, you yeah. know, all over the world when you, and you have seen some of these productions, right? I think you mentioned a particularly Itali an Ita the Italian yeah. production, uh, but what is it like, what is it like when you see your work interpreted like an, through the lens of an entirely different country? Is there anything, any of your plays that someone's really, really surprised you and made it better or really mess it up? No, the, you know, when I go, usually when I go to another country, and it doesn't matter, it's interesting when it's a four, uh, different language, but it doesn't have to be. I've seen uh, 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 productions in English that work as well, but it makes me aware of just how limited most of our directors in Canada are, that, that the amount of imagination that I saw, for example, in that Italian production of Remains, which was the first foreign language production I had seen, they were coming out of the floor, they were singing lines, they were doing this whole stylized acting thing. And what was really interesting was it didn't change the play. The laughs were still in the same place, the reactions were still in the same place. It was still the same play, but it was being done in a totally different way. And for me, that's the most exciting thing. When I go and see someone take my play and do something completely different with it, and yet be true to the script, and not mess with it or try to deconstruct it, which is everyone's obsessed with now. You know, I'm a director, I deconstruct plays. So yeah, do you know how they're constructed? Well, no, I just deconstruct them. Well, how the hell can you deconstruct them if you don't know how they're constructed? It's idiotic. So you get a lot of that in North America, but once you get off this continent, there's a lot of really interesting directors who come from countries with really extended histories of theater right, that go back much farther than ours. So on some level, I'm kind of willing to cut Canada some slack because even now the theater is so young here and it doesn't have the history and the training and the respect and all that kind of thing we see in other countries. But it, yeah. is, it is powerful to watch your work being done in another language and still see that it's the same play having the same effect on an audience. What keeps you here? I'm Canadian. I love this land. I don't want to say this country. <laughs> no, um, I know what you mean. I love this land. And, you know, when, when I was doing Queer as Folk, I mean, I had my green card guaranteed and I could have just paid the money and had my green card and stayed in LA, which I sometimes wish I had, but it was <laughs> this is America. And I didn't want to live in George Bush's America. I don't even want to live in Barack Obama's America. I don't want to live in any America, to be completely honest. And I, I had a chance to go to England, which I should have done, but and could have had a, a residency at the Royal Exchange for a couple of years and lived in Manchester, which would have been great. But I had to put my cats into quarantine for six months to do that. Oh, I and I couldn't. 
I, I, I just never... couldn't, and I hate to say it, but I stayed in Canada for my cats. It's probably the stupidest thing I've ever done. But I, I, I want to live in Toronto. I don't want to live in LA. I don't want to live in New York. I, I wouldn't mind living in London, but uh, not unless I had a lot of money. I, you yeah. know, one time <laughs> <used to laughs> London is expensive. Here where we didn't have a lot of money, but those days seemed to be gone as well. Yeah. Well, also, you're just, you know, reputation aside, you're a real softy, especially when it comes to the cats. That's, I think, one of the first times I met you. We were in a, I had done a show at Maggie Casella's cabaret and a stray kitten walked in and we we're all like, what to do? And Brad's like, I'll take it home. Well, no, it didn't quite work like that, Gavin. Now, <laughs> just let me correct you because it was far more active and we were at a John Alcorn concert. Oh, that's right. And it was you and Kyle and me and Ronnie and we went out and had a smoke at intermission and there was a kitten running around and she was really cute, but I, my cats had died a couple years earlier. I didn't want one. We went back in, we watched the second half of the show. Someone went out on the patio, the cat came bounding into the bar. All the people were running after it and she jumped in my lap. That's right. Guest, and you assholes bullied me into getting that cat and taking it home with me. And I took her home and we thought she was a kitten, but turns out she was pregnant. <laughs> and then I had to deal with a cat abortion, which I didn't want to do at all. And so I had to have her fixed and get rid of the kitties and all of that. And she's still here now. But I love telling that story. That was the she chose you, Brad. She chose yeah. you. The cat. Yeah, <laughs> She jumped right up. There was a ton of. She could have chosen any of the gays in that, in that bar. <laughs> and chose she me. chose you. Yes. Oh, that's right. And I have her happily to this very day. <laughs> um, it's, what should we talk about now? It's almost time for questions, but I want to uh, kind of talk. Uh, now we're jumping over. There's a whole. There's much more to all the rage. Keep reading it. But uh, the thing that really struck me. At the end, you write an epilogue that's just titled The Disappearing of the Queer. And I just want to talk a little bit about that because it it was really powerful writing and it really like hit home. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit about how you feel about that element well, of the whole thing, the disappearing of the queer? The, the disappearing of the queer is how we uh, historically, I mean, and, you know, we're from another generation and I'm 10 years old, 12 years older than you. So I'm from a, another generation still where, you know, when your gay son died, his friends went into the house and got rid of any signifier of being gay there before his family showed up and that kind of thing. So that after we died, there was no history of who we actually were it was all whitewashed and then I look at it and you know I fought for example when I fought to keep David in remain straight when I was dealing with uh, producers in LA to do to do the remains movie and they wanted to make him straight and I said no he has to be gay there is this some um, thing that has happened and still happens that says you know somehow we're not good enough being ourselves that in order to be accepted in order to be legitimate in order to be uh, uh, valid, we have to be at least straight acting, whatever that means, and that we have to get rid of any signifier of who we actually are. And I think it's bullshit. I think it's really a, a horrible thing. And we do it to each other. You know, gays do it, uh, queer people do it to each other. When you say, I, I only want white people, or I only want black people, when you try to uh, keep people of different, uh, uh, when you say uh, which is popular in our community, for example, that bisexuality doesn't exist. Everybody who's bi is gay. You're disappearing that particular queer person. And, and it happens all the time. And, you know, my whole thing and, and sort of the, I think the, the message of the book for me is we are enough as who we are. It is all right that we're gay. It is all right that we're trans. It is all right that we're lesbian. It is all right that we are not like other people. Let's stop disappearing each other and letting people disappear us. And let's demand to be seen all the time, even after we die. And that's a very, it's a complicated thing. And I think I, I um, uh, express it more clearly in the book. But it is the idea that we do have to stand up and be counted and not let people, any people, including our own, push us away. Or yeah, say I we're mean, not it's, good enough or disappear us because we embarrass them. But it's so it's so easy to let people do that. There's just one of the things I I really admire about you, like especially like right from the beginning on when you said, no, I'm not going to be erased. I'm going to say and because people will always warn you, well, you won't have success. And in a weird way, they're right. Like, I mean, 
in a weird way, I'm like, well, you know, if you were willing to not do that, you would be David Mamet. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yes. it's just like, oh, I know. Yeah. and we're not allowed to say that. We're supposed to be grateful for what we like. We're like, we're successful. Great. Uh, but, you know, it's always measured against a weird sort of sliding scale. Well, yes, and it is what sort of keeps my cult status. I mean, if I was a straight playwright, I would be fucking David Mamet. I would be on Broadway. I would be more in the West End. I would be in the A houses in Canada the way I was in the A houses in Manchester. It has always been my queerness that that uh, keeps me out of those things. But it's not. It's my outspoken queerness. It's my refusal to be disappeared. It's my refusal to compromise not on, on things that we compromise on in the theater all the time, but not to compromise on things that would make people more comfortable. I'm not interested in making people more comfortable. I actually want to make them less comfortable. <laughs> Everybody's too fucking comfortable, if you ask me. And we could all do with a little insecurity. So I like to take some of that security away from them and put them on the spot and make them, I mean, you know, my whole thing, and I love doing it and I get in big trouble for it, is making straight people feel what it's like to be a queer person, to be treated like a queer person. And that drives them crazy. Yeah, it's not, uh, they don't really like it. Uh, no, well, I had, do. yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting because a lot of this memoir deals with, um, in the, your career happening in the background of like the height of the AIDS epidemic when, you know, n people were just dying all over the place and right. everyone, you didn't know why people were surviving and why other people weren't surviving. Uh, and then now we're in the middle of this thing and it's in COVID and like about, I don't know, four months ago, a pretty good straight friend of mine said like, isn't this unbelievable? Like we've never been through anything like this before. And I thought my head was going to explode because yes. <laughs> I was like, no, we have, you just didn't care. And oh, they did not like that. No, and they did not care. And I'm not going to I'm not going to revise that to make people more comfortable. I mean, a big part of why the book is called All the Rage is because of the rage I feel at the straight world, specifically for the way they dealt with us during the AIDS crisis, because they either most of them either didn't care or celebrated it. You know, and there were there was a small minority, and certainly I knew a, a, a number of straight women mostly, but there were a couple men who were working on the sidelines and were right in there with everyone else. But it was mostly the indifference that that uh, that really colored my perception of the straight world. And when you talk about my unwillingness to compromise or be disappeared, I wonder if AIDS hadn't happened if I would have been a very happy compromiser in order to make money and fit in and all of that kind of thing. But it was almost like, excuse me, yeah. AIDS happened and I had no choice. I had no other choice. Yeah. Or if they had stepped up and been like, let's cure this instead of being like, well, it's only those guys. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. That's uh, so I just should mention right now, because uh, Brad and I have gotten talking and I could do this all night long, but I shouldn't. Uh, if you have questions that you would like to ask Brad, please uh, put them in the Q&A and I will put them to Brad as they come in. Uh, and uh, while we're waiting for those questions, let me just ask you this. Uh, I'm sure that you've been asked to tell the story many times in the past. Why did you pick now to write the memoir? Well, um, I, I had been asked a number of times if I would write a memoir, and I always said, no, no, the story is not over, and I'm far too young, and there's blah, blah going on. Um, every year on gay, uh, sorry, every day, every year on uh, AIDS uh, Remembrance Day on December 1st, I have a huge file of photographs of people famous and not who were lost to AIDS, and I'm talking about hundreds, if not thousands, uh, that I put up on social media. All the, every every World AIDS Day, I put them up on Facebook. I put them up on Twitter without an explanation, just the picture and the name. And uh, Bruce Walsh, who was at the University of Regina Press at that time, came to me and he said, "You know, this is really interesting. Nobody's talking about this. You bring it up every year. You're very specific about it. You probably have a lot of stories about those people. Why don't you write a memoir where you integrate those stories and those people into it and talk about those years specifically?" And when he proposed it that way, suddenly I went, oh, great. It's not a memoir just about me. It's actually a way for me 
to evoke and bring back people like Tad and, and all the Cam and all these, these wonderful men that I loved who were my best friends who came out with me, who grew up with me and all of that. And I could honor them. So I felt like I wasn't just sort of wanking on myself and this is my life, but I actually got to talk about their lives because there are very few people who remember them anymore. You know, like we, we are, our, our generation was decimated. And I feel like it's my job to not let people forget. So, so that made me go, okay, yes, all right. I can write a memoir with those parameters. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's, I mean, there was so many just in all the rage. There's so many compelling <laughs> characters and friends of yours that you detail those relationships and, you know, yeah, and, and, that's and beautiful cool. and messy and also not um, maudlin. Did I appreciate that you're, yeah, well, I mean, it's you, so you tend to be blunt anyways, but you you get into the nitty, the drugs, the parties, the sex, the fun, and the sadness, which I feel like AIDS work, anything that has to do with AIDS that's happened in the last 20 years is sort of like a, a kind of a bit of a playbook of here's the sad parts. We can't talk about any of the fun stuff that happened. Right, but the, yeah, there was a lot of uh, fun stuff and there was a lot of fun stuff. I mean, when you know you're sick, when you know you're going to die, when you know uh, you could potentially be infected. I mean, there is a freedom in that. And a lot of people I know became much more interesting people after they were infected than they had been before, whether they became warriors or whether they became uh, uh, you know, the outspoken person who confronts everyone, whatever it was. AIDS actually made a lot of positive changes in our community and certainly in me. Like, as I said, I don't know if, if the stuff that happened with Remains, the original production, for example, where the, where the original director quit, if I had not at that time been convinced that I was HIV positive and probably going to die, I don't know if I would have done any of those things that I did. But when you feel like you have nothing to lose, you got nothing to lose, right? So there we go. And then as I started to realize, hey, this nothing to lose thing works really well. It not only pushes you farther, it pushes everyone else around you farther. I really rode that for a long time. And it was <laughs> later on when I found out that, that I was actually negative and had never been affected and all of that, that I started getting cautious with things again and would have to remind myself, no, no, your life worked best when you thought you were going to be dead within a year. Don't let go of that. And now that I'm 62, I'm back to that again. <laughs> well, maybe not within a year, Brad. Well, um, I'm going to give you this question uh, that came in from Jerry. Uh, you said you had to cut a lot of material when getting the book to publication. What he wants to know is the hardest thing to cut. You know what the hardest things to do? I've done some things I'm not wildly proud of in my life, and, and I've... Um, done things to people that I don't really feel proud of after. And weirdly, because I'm, I am Mr. Honesty, and a lot of those are still in the book, you know, but, you know, the editor said, you don't need all of these. Like, you know, we, we, get, we get the idea. Like, you don't have to overbalance what an asshole you are, you know, to, to make up for the fact that sometimes people like you. It's okay. It's okay to go with that. And it was, I felt like a bit of a, a fraud when I would take out the unpleasant things about myself. I felt like I was, I was sort of curating my personality in a way that people who know me would go, yeah, he's not that great. He's not that nice. Uh, and so I, I didn't want to give a false impression of who no, I was. No, I've read it. You still seem like a bit of an a-hole. Yeah, well. Uh, <laughs> it's in there. You're, it's being true to you. You know, there's also the kinder, softer Brad that, uh, you know, yeah, people but get to the, know. You know, in terms of when I wrote it, I wrote everything. Like I just wrote anything I could remember that felt like it would be of note or worthy to be in a book. And then I had to cut 150,000 words uh, out of the book, which is a tremendous amount of material. How but did you remember? Like, sorry? How did you even remember? I was I wondering that, the, did, did you a journal or did you, you just no, have memory, no, memory, memory? I just, I remember really well. I have big nostrils, which means I smell a lot. I think that that, uh, is a big part of why my memory works so well. But I can recall, I can recall like the first time I saw you do something at Buddies and Bad Times like 25 years ago, you know? I can probably recall what you were wearing if I really wanted to, to sit down and do it. So 
I'm not saying I'm always 100% accurate with that, but I've got a pretty good memory. And I also taught myself to be a writer from a young person and a writer or to be a cartoonist, I wanted to be either, has to remember things. You know, if you're gonna draw a tree, you don't wanna to have to go look at a picture of a tree every time you draw it. If you wanna draw a particular kind of person, you don't necessarily wanna to have to go and research that person. So carry it around in your memory. So I have that writer thing of reviewing things quite often, what happened, how did that play out, who was there, all of that kind of thing. And I think part of it is just, you know, some people get memories, some people don't. I do love that you said you have big nostrils because now that I think about it, this, there are a lot of smells in your memoir and it's very, yeah. it's, they're very evocative. Yeah, well, uh, I, I, very, I see things, I smell things, I feel things. I mean, I'm a very sensual I person wish I and writer in that way. And also, you know, memory and sex are basically based on smell, smell or music. You know, the, yeah. those are the two things that affect us the most. So those are the two things that I go to. Um, Anne Marie wants to know, how do you feel about the current trend in theater to put on productions that don't offend anyone? I think they're the death of theater. I think they're why nobody goes to the theater anymore. You know, theater has become, and I'm not kidding when I say this, theater has become a thing that other theater people go to, particularly if it's not the commercial kind of Broadway Mervish kind of stuff. And, and I walk into the factory or I walk into Tarragon or I walk into the second pace at space at can stage when they had it. And it's like, I know all these people. I work with all these people. Why are we all going to the same thing? Why don't we see any new people here? And it's because we're doing shows for one another. We're doing shows for the fucking critics. And they're the worst people we should be doing shows for. They've got no connection to the real world or a real audience at all. And it's, taken this world that I worked really hard to expand and to, to reach out and get big groups of people and come in and then they come back and see something else that someone else has done and go, oh, I'm never going to the theater again. That's boring. Everybody's just nice. Everybody just talks. Peter on Facebook would like to know, after all these years, do you think there is pinkwashing still around in the queer community? Well, I think pinkwashing happens more in the straight community, doesn't it? I mean, isn't that where uh, we're pretending that we love gay people so that we can sponsor a float in the parade or something and then still give money to right wing groups or chicken fillet or something? I mean, pinkwashing goes on. I don't know why the queer community does it to itself, but I'm amazed how we will accept it. I'm amazed how we'll go, oh, look, the bank is really nice. They put a float in our parade and they gave us some drinks as opposed to you know what they're charging people in interest? Do you know what fees are right now? Why the hell are we letting these people anywhere near us? And as we talk about this, I'm writing a, 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 an essay right now on you know where I would like to see pride in 40 years. And I really think the, the corporatization of pride, the acceptance of it by the wider world, that it becoming a place where straight girls can come and get really drunk and pee on the road and stuff was the death of pride. And that this break we're having right now is maybe a good thing because we can all go back to uh, uh, being defiant marchers demanding to be seen rather than corporate shills out there doing their work for them. Well, there's a whole thing on Twitter today that was happening with people sort of uh, one person kind of calling for like the like the saying that, you know, there shouldn't be kinks at Pride. It's a family event and people going oh, the kind of nuts aliens. over Those that. But it, but um, and but that was like coming from within the queer community. So it's again, it's like that weird sort of. But that, that has always been there. We dealt with that in the 90s, too. You know, people were saying, we, 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 you know, we have, we have families here. We have children here. You know, why are they showing their asses? Why are they marching naked? Why are those women showing their breasts? It's like, you know, this is a queer world. This, we're called homosexuals for a reason. You're called <laughs> I mean, heterosexuals for a reason. We're, we're, is there hope or are we just on a rinse and repeat? You know, if there's hope to be found, it's going to be found from the people who refuse to follow the rules, who the people who refuse to toe the line, the people who who are willing to say this is different, it needs to be different. It's all it's all bullshit. It's all this fake kind of we're tolerated and we're accepted. And you know, if you walk out of Toronto, if you walk out of downtown Toronto, kids are not growing up any different than you or I did being the fag kid at school, right? I mean, there's still kids yeah. who are being tormented the same way. There's still people holding them down and cutting their little ponytails off and stuff like that. It's just as hostile out there. It's only these little pockets of 
tolerance that we've developed that are mostly just worlds we live in where we talk to each other and sort of exclude the outside world. Things aren't nearly as good, I believe, as people think they are. <laughs> I would probably agree and with they that. Would be, we just need the right thing to happen and they'll be rounding us all up and putting us on boxcars again, you know, just like they did before. All right. Thanks for the hope. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Jean-Francois wants to know, will All the Rage be uh, coming out in a French translation anytime soon? Will there be a French translation? I, I don't know. That's uh, The whole world of publishing is brand new to me. This is my very first book, and I don't know how any of it works. It all takes a really long time for anything to happen. So I would say I would hope so, but that really would be left up to the publishers. All right. And, um, and one more question from the audience. Uh, what uh, are you writing more plays? What's next for you? Well, I'm mostly, and I'm glad I did, I'm mostly writing uh, a book that I just put out and screenplays right now, but I do have an, uh, a new play that I've been working on that's a very big play I haven't been able to get a producer for. So maybe when this is all over, you know, that the, some of the producers will go, oh yeah, Brad used to make us a lot of money. Let's take a look at that play of his and see if we can get some people into the theater with that. Uh, and... Uh... I don't know what else should we go uh before we leave i want to just uh i want to talk about your facebook uh for a moment <laughs> just because i follow you and uh you know you over the pandemic have been basically uh kind of your best friend now is shirley yes <laughs> who you've been taking care of she is she has dementia yes am i yes. correct on that so you've been being very careful but you've been getting all of her necessities how has that year been uh Interesting. I mean, I, I wonder what I would have been doing without Shirley. You know, there are guys who are still partying out there, having people over to the house. I mean, I haven't been laid in 15 months, which is a record for my life <laughs> uh, and making me a bit cranky. But um, if, if I didn't have her, would I have COVID? Would I be out there doing something? Would I be getting in trouble? I don't know. But I do know that um, I would not have the discipline I've had over this period because I've got to be up at a certain hour to check on her. I've got to go up there and make sure she gets her lunch. I've got to call her in the evening. You know, I've got to pick up her medicine, whatever. I, I mean, I think if I didn't have that to do, I would be sort of much fatter laying around drinking a lot more bourbon and masturbating a lot more. And she's kept me away from pretty much all of those things till at least nine or 10 nights. So, you know, in that level, I think she's been a gift. That's amazing. Well, um, I am, they're telling me I need to wrap it up, but this has been delightful. Thank you so much for Lovely chatting you, with me. It's nice to see you. I look forward to when I can see you in uh, actual, Person. yeah, when I can, when you can smell me with those nostrils again, I'll exactly. be very excited. Come over and sniff your new cat. <laughs> Thank you. That'll be very exciting. Uh, yes, yeah, so and give my best to Maggie, your cat. Thanks to everyone who tuned in and uh, please uh, rush out and, uh, or go to the library and get, all the rage because uh, it really is a fascinating read and uh, it's a great book. Congratulations, Brad. Thank you very much. And I just want to mention tomorrow night, uh, the Governor General's Literary Award winner, Thomas King, will be discussing his latest novel, Sufferance. So you can find that here. And thank you so much to Ottawa Public Library for having us. Uh, have a great night, Brad. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Buy my book. <laughs> buy the book. on Twitter and Facebook. All the rage. Bye. Bye. -bye.